So just a um, bit of housekeeping, if you can remember to uh, keep your microphone on mute when um, we're the, the, during the talk so we don't get any interference, but please do keep your cameras on. It's lovely for the speaker and us to see lots of uh, friendly faces. Um, and this is our last uh, Conscious Club of the term. So we're then gonna have a uh, summer break. We're still keeping it under review as to how we will resume in um, September, but there will be certainly a virtual component given how brilliant it's been to see everybody dining in from all over the, all over the world for these meetings. Um, so it's a real pleasure to um, be able to introduce Richard Brown for this talk. Um, so Richard and I have known each other for several years. Um, I got to know Richard when I was a postdoc at NYU um, and we actually even played in a, in a band together, um, which uh, Richard plays drums and I used to play keyboard very badly. Um, <laughs> and so that was a lot of fun. And many of you will also know Richard from his fantastic uh, online engagement with the Consciousness Live uh, um, sessions that he runs. Um, so Richard did his PhD in philosophy uh, with a concentration in cognitive science from the City, of Uni City University of New York, so CUNY, Graduate Centre in 2008 and he's now a professor at CUNY in the philosophy program at LaGuardia Community College um, and he's also a member of the cognitive neuroscience faculty at the Graduate Centre at CUNY and Rich's work is focused uh, broadly on philosophy of mind, consciousness studies, uh, foundations of cognitive science. Um, he also has interests in philosophy of language, meta-ethics, philosophy of physics, logic and the history of philosophy. And many of you also know uh, Richard from his work on higher order theories of consciousness. And that's what he's gonna be telling us about today. So take it away, Richard. It's a real pleasure to have you join us. Um, wow, thank you for that introduction, Steve. That's, that's really nice. And, and let me also just say that it's, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, just on a side note before beginning, being uh, part of these online presentations over the last year or so has really been a highlight uh, of what's been going on. So while the pandemic's been obviously terrible in many ways, this, this opportunity has been fantastic. And so I feel very honored to be a part of it. And I want to thank the organizers and all of that stuff. So I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start doing what we're doing here. So we're, uh, oh, by the way, before I do that, let me say I'm having to take questions anytime, just interrupt me, clarificatory or not. Um, we could, we could have it out right now over the first slide. So I'm happy to have discussion at any moment. Um, okay, so my topic today is to rethinking the higher order thought theory of consciousness. This is something I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, and my, of course my, uh, oops, I'm trying to advance my slides, there we go. My goal uh, is not to do this because I object to the higher order theory. In fact, what I am interested in is trying to understand the higher order theory uh, from the perspective of trying to falsify it empirically. So what I'm interested in is how should you think about what the higher order theory of consciousness says, what the theory's goal is, how it approaches the topic, if what your main goal was falsifying the theory um, empirically. And so <clears throat> it's surprisingly, it turns out that uh, after thinking about this for a long time, it seems to me that the usual way that the theory is introduced, talked about, and et cetera, is just not the right way to think about the theory. It's kind of um, in my opinion, somewhat uh, needs to be updated um, uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. So first of all, before I start going through this, as I said, I, I'm not really trying to object to the higher order theory. I'm not really trying to defend it either. Um, my, my position here is one of trying to explore the theory and develop it in enough detail so we could ask these questions. How would you falsify these kinds of theories? And my own like beliefs, I, I have some intuitive uh, pull towards the higher order approach, generally speaking, but I have some sympathy towards first order theories and theories of all sorts. I really think it's too early. Um, and that what we ought to do is explore the theories and their relation to data. And that's what I've done in a lot of my work, exploring the way the basic idea of the higher order approach can be expanded, implemented, changed, and still be a higher order theory. So that's, that's the goal that I have today. Um, and the exciting and interesting Reason, the thing that, that uh, the reason why I'm doing all this that's interesting to me is because higher order theories are relatively newcomers <clears throat> in this discussion. And while there's a long history of discussion in philosophy, 
you know, depending on who you talk to, maybe going back to Aristotle, uh, maybe Kant. Uh, so people will debate that in the history of philosophy literature. But anyway, so some people say that kind of thing. Um, certainly in the analytic tradition since the 60s with David Armstrong and higher order perception theories, and in the 80s with David Rosenthal and the higher order thought theory, these have been discussed in the philosophical literature, and they've made some connections to the empirical literature, but people haven't really uh, addressed the question, um, how should we think about the theory if we're interested in the science of the theory? If this is an empirical conjecture about the nature of consciousness, how should we think about it? So this has really only started to happen in the last 10 years or so. Um, now, there's always been scientists who have adopted some kind of higher order approach, uh, maybe as their personal view, but it's only really recently that scientists have as a group said, okay, so if we wanted to test these theories, what should we do? And I think of the uh, Rosenthal and Lau 2011 Trends in Cognitive Science paper as really kind of a landmark paper in this area where uh, galvanizing some interest. And so that's what I'm, that's the question that I'm interested in today. All right, so if one was interested in the higher order thought theory of consciousness and one were completely new to the field, maybe a graduate student or a scientist who hadn't been versed in these areas and was looking for some clarification, one might appeal to authoritative sources like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is a well-known online source. And so this entry was written in 2001, but we can see it was updated very recently. So it was written by Peter Carruthers, who used to be a defender of a version of higher order thought theory. And so the very first sentence right there says, higher order theories of consciousness tried to explain the difference between unconscious and conscious mental states in terms of a relation obtaining between the conscious states. Uh, and so the first order state, which is conscious and the higher order state, which is directed or representing it. So we can see a couple of themes there. You see phenomenal consciousness comes up right after that. So this is not a very unstandard way of doing things. Typically, you know, if you look around, right? So if you go to the internet encyclopedia of philosophy, now this is written by Rocco Gennaro, another well-known defender of the higher order thought theory. And there's a bunch of stuff there. First sentence, once again, key question, what makes a mental state conscious? Um, for our purposes, this is the sentence that I want us to pay attention to. Um, it says that conscious mental states arise when two unconscious mental states are related in a certain way namely that one of them, the higher order one, is directed or related to the other one. And the basic idea there is called the transitivity principle. You can see down at the bottom of your screen. So once again, we see the very same kind of themes. There's two states, there's a relation between them, and that's the uh, structure which explains how the state becomes conscious. So then we look over here, we see an article by David Rosenthal and Josh Weisberg. Um, this is from the Scholarpedia article, so it's kind of like Wikipedia, but uh, for, you know, experts written by it. So the very first sentence here again says, higher order theories of consciousness seek to explain what it is for mental states to be conscious as against occurring non-consciously by appeal to other higher order mental states that represent one as being in the states in question. And then there's some stuff, and we don't need that, but there's the transitivity principle. And so it's very much, in a way, similar to what we have been seeing from the other kinds of um, introductory materials. But it seems to me that this way of setting up the problem uh, is problematic and it obscures some interesting variations of the theory. So I think that there really are two reasons why this whole approach to setting up the, what the theory is, how to think about it is just misguided and should be rethought. And the first reason to understand it, I, I want to introduce a distinction that I think is somewhat um, often overlooked, but I'm trying to get people to pay attention to it. And that's this distinction between what I call relational and non-relational versions of the higher order theory. So relational versions of the theory, and these are the much more familiar ones, I think. Um, what they try to do is they try to attempt to explain how the first order state itself becomes a conscious state. So we, we start off thinking there's some first order, there's a, a seeing of bread, let's call him Bob. Bob shows up as a visual representation in your visual system, Bob may be unconscious. And then these theories seek to answer the question, how does Bob turn into a conscious state? So the whole point of view is from the first order state's point of view, so to speak. And the question is, what happens to that state? How does it get transformed into being a conscious state? And as we saw, that was the way the higher order theory was presented in at least two of three of those introductory source materials 
Peter Carruthers, Rocco Gennaro, both higher order thought theorists at one time defending this view presented this way. Now, what's interesting is that there was no talk about relations in the Rosenthal-Weisberg presentation, but there was this business about transitive consciousness and conscious of. But what's often unnoticed is that this is interpreted in a non-relational way. And it's this other side of thinking about higher order theories that is often obscured and that I've been trying to call attention to. And so non-relational theories deny the relational picture. What they say is, look, you don't need to have two states with this special relation between them in order to turn the first order state into a conscious state. Rather, the point of view is that the higher order representation occurring is all by itself enough to explain consciousness, period, end of story. And so it's not really been noticed that there are these two different ways of interpreting this foundational phrase, which as we saw, all three of those major figures in this literature accept, all of them agree that a conscious state is one I am conscious of. Two of them interpret that in a relational way, Carruthers and Gennaro. And one of them, I argue, and I think uh, it's pretty clear from reading the text that Rosenthal and other defenders uh, like myself, um, I know what I would say because I'm me, but uh, that we interpret this in a non-relational way. So that's the first problem that I wanna point out is that if you present things in the way the traditional picture does, the very possibility of a non-relational picture is obscured. And, and people just haven't really paid attention to it. And so that's not to say that relational theories are bad. It's that we want to distinguish them and try to empirically test them. And the way that the very approach has been presented typically obscures this whole other interesting possibility. Now, the second problem, and I think equally important, but something you know that I uh, think should be pointed out is that if you come around and say that the whole point of a theory of consciousness is to explain this difference, between conscious and unconscious mental states, then you have begged the question about whether there are any unconscious mental states. And certainly we, I know that, you know, work from Ha Kwan Lao and Megan Peters, there's a question about whether we have enough evidence for truly unconscious states, although they're kind of widely thought informally to exist, whether we've demonstrated that is, a, is an empirical question. Even in the case of blind sight, there are people who argue that it may be a kind of really degraded vision um, which is uh, qualitatively different from normal vision, but nonetheless conscious phenomenally, like Ian Phillips has made that, that argument. And I don't know what the right view is here, but what I do know is that whatever of these two views is right is not gonna falsify the higher order approach to consciousness because higher order theorists can perfectly well accept that mental states never occur unconsciously, they would also just have to stipulate that something about higher order blah, blah, blah also occurs when they occur. And that is not impossible. So this is an empirical question, whether there are truly unconscious mental states in this way. And I don't think we've answered that question. And we may and you know have views about it, but I don't think the evidence is in, in, in a serious way. Um, and But the thing to note that is if it comes out that there are unconscious mental states, higher order theory can explain it. If it turns out there aren't unconscious mental states, higher order theory can explain it. So the upshot then is that that whole way of presenting the picture sort of smuggles in some assumptions, begs a question that I think is an empirical question, obscures the possibility of an interesting other class of theories. And so that we should step back and say, all right, so if that's not the right way to, to present the theory, what is the right way to present it? Well, funny you should ask, that question, haha. <laughs> because if I were to write an article like that, I would present the picture very differently. Now, remember that my allegiances are split. I'm not here thinking this is that I'm right. What I'm here is that um, I think that this is a way that we should think about the theory if we're interested in testing it and remaining neutral on these other sorts of questions. So it seems to me that any theory of consciousness can be classified as higher order or first order. And I've always thought that. And I've always had some intuitive uh, draw to the higher order approach. So then if I'm not accepting the traditional view, which I've always felt somewhat uncomfortable with, then what? how do I think of it? Well, the way I think about higher order theories is that they are the kinds of theories which appeal to a kind of inner awareness as part of the explanation for phenomenal consciousness. So when I 
if I were thinking about what a higher order theory is and how to introduce it, this is how I would introduce it. These are the kinds of theories that have as their explanatory target, phenomenal consciousness, and they seek to explain it in terms of a kind of inner awareness. First order theories on this reading, and I'll say more about those terms that I have thrown around up there in just a second, but first order theories on this reading are simply theories which deny that any kind of inner awareness is important to phenomenal consciousness. So global workspace theory, attention schema, integrated information theory, recurrent processing, most of these theories which are known by name in the literature um, are first order theories in this sense. Global workspace theory as is typically introduced makes no reference to any kind of inner awareness being important, although it does appeal to higher order brain areas in the prefrontal cortex. They aren't thought to be fulfilling this function of giving you a kind of inner awareness of the first order states. Same with the attention schema, even though Michael Graziano has argued recently that hit, you know, attention schema theory can be thought of as kind of unifying higher order theories with uh, global workspace theories. Um, Joe Ledoux and I wrote a kind of comment on this recent paper where we argued that since there may be kinds of higher order representations in the attention schema, representations whose content is other representations, although PS is not even clear if that's really what's in the attention schema, but, but you can make sense that maybe there are those kinds of representations, but even so, they wouldn't be, the, the higher order theory doesn't just say any old higher order representation matters. It says that there's a kind of inner awareness that matters. And then there's a hypothesis about the nature of that involving um, a, spe, a kind of higher order representation. So attention schema as it's typically presented is not a higher order theory as I understand it. And the same is true for IIT, the postulates are explicitly first order. Same is true for recurrent processing, et cetera. Now, as I see things, each one of these theories is a theory, a possible theory of what the first order states are. So global workspace theory is a possible theory about what first order states are. No, maybe attention schema theory is a better theory about what first order states are, but you could take any one of these and add higher order machinery to it and have a version of higher order theory. In fact, my personal suspicion is that Bernie Bars, the originator of the global workspace theory in his original formulation of it in the early book in the eighties, Cognitive Theory of Consciousness, he presents global broadcasting as a necessary condition for consciousness, but not sufficient. In the second half of the book, he argues that in order for sufficiency, you need access by a self system to the globally broadcast contents, which sounds suspiciously like a kind of higher order theory with a first order global workspace version of what, excuse me, a first order, uh, a global workspace theory of what first order states are. Now, I don't know, I've talked to Bernie a couple of times. Just, I can never get a clear answer from him on this particular question, but you could at least imagine some kind of higher order machinery being attached to each one of these theories. But as they stand, they are first order theories. Uh, and so it's often thought that like, oh yeah, there's all these theories of first order theories and then the higher order thought theory, it's on the other side, but really it's not a monolithic thing. And there are different versions of it. And so one of my goals here today is to get us to recognize that there are, there are different versions of the higher thought theory. They make different empirical predictions and that's really the interesting thing. All right, so according to me, the goal of a theory of consciousness is to explain phenomenal consciousness. So I'm gonna come back and say a little bit about that shortly. But what about inner awareness? What is this mysterious term? Well, as I use the term, awareness is uh, commonsensically, usually we say we're aware of something when we perceive it in the environment or maybe when we think about it, if I think, Doug is behind me, but I'm not looking behind me. Am I aware of Doug? Well, the higher thought theory is typically presented says yes, and then tries to build on that. But that's a kind of awareness, not a perceptual awareness, but a kind of cognitive awareness. So I think that you can connect both of these ideas to just representing. So awareness, as I use that term, means representing. And the inner bit is the higher order part. So when you say, according to me, that a higher order theory appeals to inner awareness, then I think you can give an argument that inner awareness amounts to higher order representation. Now I have that argument, it's in a slide in the back. I'm not gonna present it. If anyone cares, you can, we can talk about it. Uh, but I think that it's reasonable. And I know that people disagree with me. Like I have an argument with Ned Block currently about whether inner awareness can, can only be understood from the higher order point of view or whether you can have a first order theory of inner awareness. We disagree about that. That's a separate issue anyway. So suppose that you think that, as I do, that inner awareness amounts to a kind of higher order representation. 
Well, then you arrive at what I think of as a representational theory of consciousness, but from the higher order point of view. So remember what I'm doing is I'm kind of stepping back and I'm thinking if you came to this as kind of starting over and you wanted to sort of explain what the basic idea was, how to think about the theory, how to test it. And I'm sorry, there's not a lot of empirical work right now at this point, because I'm just trying to conceptually clarify, in my opinion, what would count as having empirical evidence for or against the theory. So I apologize that this talk in particular is very like abstract conceptually, but uh, I think that's important at, at this stage and where we are in our data collection. Anyway, okay. So I think this is a kind of representational theory. We can get into the details of that. I don't know if we really need to at this point. So I've said that a theory of consciousness has to be a theory of phenomenal consciousness. And phenomenal consciousness is a, is a word that sometimes people are suspicious of. I'm not. Um, I think we can make sense of it simply as picking out experience. And so I have, you know, Nagel's term, there's something that it's like to be. We can use that in various ways to talk about a subject being phenomenally conscious. We can talk about a state being phenomenally conscious. We can talk about phenomenal properties and phenomenal character. And all of that, mean, all that stuff just means we're talking about what it's like from our point of view. So a subject is phenomenally conscious when there's something that it's like to be that subject. A state is phenomenally conscious when there's something that it's like to be in that state. Those are interchangeable in my view. Nothing, nothing really hangs on which way you want to talk. They all just amount to capturing that basic idea. So as I understand the, the landscape here, panpsychism, higher order thought theories, global workspace, attention schema, all of these theories, which are non-illusionist theories, are aimed at explaining phenomenal consciousness. I reject illusionism. Phenomenal consciousness is real, so I think. And we wanna understand what its true nature is, not give up the game and say it's too hard, we can't understand it, it must be an illusion that we have it. So in my view, theories of consciousness, if they are to be taken as theories of consciousness as opposed to theories of how we think there's consciousness, um, then they must be theories of phenomenal consciousness understood in this way. So that this is a neutral term, which is common between first order, higher order approaches, dualist and physicalist approaches, every sort of approach in the universe, even the illusionists agree with us, they just deny that this can be physical. So that's the what a theory of consciousness should be aiming at understanding. And the higher order approach says we can understand that in terms of a specific kind of higher order representational content. And you may disagree with that. To me, that's an empirical conjecture um, about the real nature of phenomenal consciousness. Now, maybe you think you can't empirically have a theory of the nature of empirical con I think you can, we can discuss that. All right, so what kind of content matters here? Well, traditionally, remember I'm going back and sort of go starting over again. The basic idea of the higher order approach has been that there's this kind of inner awareness understood as we are now in terms of higher order representation. And so the awareness is of mental occurrences going on in your own mental life. And so the conjecture here is that when you represent yourself as seeing red, for example, um, or hearing a trumpet or whatever the case may be, then that is all there is to the experience of seeing red or hearing the trumpet. So that's the basic idea. Now, what's not been noticed and what I've been trying to point out is that there are two interpretations of this basic idea of what it means to represent yourself as seeing red. There is the familiar relational views. So in philosophy, Uriah Kriegel has argued for his same order monitoring theory. Rocco Gennaro, the wide intentionality view. Pak Wan Lao, the perceptual reality monitoring view. These are all different versions of the basic idea that the relational account is right, that there's a first order state, there's a higher order state, there's a relation between them and the first order state contributes, becomes conscious. And so what it's like for you, the experience you have is determined by that. Whereas, and Rosenthal is often associated over here. In my opinion, erroneously, mistakenly, people have thought this is where you put that kind of theory, but in fact, it should be over here. Rosenthal's version of higher order thought theory is a non-relational version of this theory. And so is the view that I like, which I have called the horror theory, which is the higher order representation of a representation, um, which uh, I'm gonna sort of, since the attention has mostly been on these over here, uh, I'm gonna focus on these over here because I think they're less well understood. 
in the way that I'm putting things. Okay, so that's sort of where I'm at right now. So what really is the difference between these two things? Well, I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. And to be honest, <laughs> it's not 100% clear. Um, but it, I've worked with uh, the, you know, Jacob Berger and I have a paper together where we try to figure this out. It's coming out in philosophical psychology um, someday, whenever they, I mean, it's, it's accepted or whatever, but whenever they get to it. Uh, but the way we think of things is that on the traditional kind of higher order thought theory, the higher order states engender conscious states. They produce them or somehow the, the, the conscious states are the result of the higher order thought. Uh, whereas on the way I think about things, the higher order representation is itself the phenomenally conscious state. So that is a way that we disagree about what the goal of the theory is and also how to understand what the theory says. Um, now, there's the question to me that's interesting is whether there's anything more than terminological here. And actually, I'd be happy if it were just terminological, um, if this were just a way of interpreting that, that traditional theory in, in current modern terms, I would be happy with that. But I actually suspect that maybe it's not merely terminological. And so I kind of want to focus on that. So what kind of content is this non-relational view proposing? Well, remember that according to the non-relational view, consciousness requires merely the occurrence of the higher order state. The first order state is optional. It's not, it's not required. It's just having this kind of content. So the way I think of it is in terms of, you know, maybe this is like a language, a sentence in the language of thought, it's some kind of representation. I think Rosenthal thinks of it as like an ordinary thought. I, I tend to think of it maybe as the product of a special module. Maybe I, It's hard for me to see how it could be an ordinary thought that results in phenomenal consciousness. Um, but maybe, maybe it is. That's why I speak of higher order representations and not higher order thoughts, uh, because I don't think of them as just like typical workaday thoughts like I'm having right now when I'm speaking to you. Anyway, okay. So what's the content of these thoughts? Well, these are conceptual concepts on the way that we're talking about here. Um, uh, and so as I put things, the, then the horror theory says that when you have a phenomenally conscious state with a certain phenomenal character, you just have the correct higher order representation. And the content of that higher representation, it says you're in the state, which has that character. Now in conversation, Ned Block has told me this is overly technical and that I should just put it this way, that having a state with certain phenomenal character is just having the higher order representation that you have that phenomenal character. And I could put that in a slogan form by saying for phenomenal character, if you represent that you have it, then you have it. So. So I don't know, is this exactly equivalent to the way I put it? Yeah, probably Ned's smarter than me. So, you know, if, uh, but uh, certainly this is along the lines, right? This is along the lines. The idea is simply that the occurrence of the higher order states, as I understand it, just is the phenomenally conscious state. It's not the first order state. The first order state is not phenomenally conscious. Um, as I understand, that means there's nothing that it's like to be in the first order state. There's something that it's like for you to be in the higher order state. So what are the components of this content? Well, one component is the mental analog of I serving to pick me out and attribute the state to me as a state of mind. Philosophers have called this the essential indexical, but this to me seems to be an essential, it's just gotta be a component of the content. And if we really had the tools to get fine grained about the content, I think that would be a part of it, but not so sophisticated that a squirrel couldn't have it or um, you know, possibly, <clears throat> Could a bee have a state like this? Uh, it doesn't, I don't see why it couldn't. So I think people typically read too much into the requirement that there be some kind of self-referential term in the content of the higher order state. There's also this bit that says you're aware of something. So awareness, I'm arguing we can think of awareness in terms of representing. Other people have argued you can think of it in other ways. There's a whole other branch of this like people exploring other ways that you could be, is like attention a way that you could be aware. So what about quotation? Could you have hired a quotation models? I mean, really someone needs to write a book on this and I'm hoping that someone isn't me, but uh, someone should do it. Um, anyway, so we th there's that part of the representation which uh, conceptually attributes to you an awareness of something. And then we need to say what that awareness relation is. So you could say the content here is purely descriptive and so to be picked out by the content is to satisfy a description, or you could postulate that there's some kind of index or pointer content 
um, some kind of a demonstrative, like a, a pointing or a causal historical link, or if you like, you know, um, causal historical theories of intentionality, a lot depends on what your theory of intentionality is, in other words, about how this is all going to get fleshed out. We also need to say something about how you describe what concepts you're deploying. So, you know, the concept red, does it pick out the mental quality? Does it pick out the perceptible property in the environment? But not a lot of attention has been paid to this. And then, of course, I think this last bit is that you also describe yourself as being presented with this perceptible property. So each part of this to me seems if we really knew how to decode content of mental states in the right way, we would find elements corresponding to each part of this and varying one part but not the other would change what it's like for you. And so there are opportunities for testing if we had more fine grained tools. Now, of course, the devil's in the details and how you do that, that's the hard part, but I'm the philosopher here. You guys are the experimentalists or some of you are. So, um, so putting this a little bit more pictorially. So I sort of assume that we all agree that what we're doing at the beginning is trying to explain the way things appear. So suppose this red circle is your mind. Suppose this over here is the physical world out there. Whether this is really the way things are certainly appears to me that the way things are is that there's a world out there, there's objects, they have properties, they have colors, sounds, shapes, etc. So we postulate some representations of those things. People will debate about what kind of content those representations have. Maybe they have some kind of non-conceptual content. Maybe they have conceptual content. Maybe it's just one or the other. Maybe it's both. There's a whole debate about that. But on the higher order approach, the basic idea is all of that stuff is unrelated to conscious experience. You could have that. You could represent that there's red in the environment. You could behave in appropriate ways, saying there's red, pushing buttons, et cetera, um, and not have any conscious experience, at least conceptually in principle, super blindsiders, if you know that literature, if you not, if you don't, then you know the idea that you could, you know, be functionally sort of behaviorally the same as a typically conscious person, but have no conscious experience at all. At least conceptually, this could happen if all you had were the first order levels stuff. So often people conflate a way to test or falsify higher order theories with a way of checking what's going on at this level. And I think that's a danger because according to the theory, in order to see red, in order to experience it, you need to have the right higher perception excuse me, the higher order thought, which then results in, first of all, you becoming aware of yourself as being in this state, but also you experiencing the red out there so that the higher order state describes you as being presented with this property in the world. So that's how you explain it. That's how you experience it. You experience yourself in the way first order theorists typically say as being in the state of being acquainted or something with this property. But the explanation of how that occurs according to the higher order theory is by way of this higher order representation. Yeah, the super blind sight reference comes from Ned Block's um, paper on a confusion about a function of consciousness, which is an early paper uh, on, on this stuff. Uh, and I can put a link to that in the chat afterwards. Um, now, so why do I think that it's the higher order state, which is the phenomenally conscious state? Well, the answer is because if you think about cases where the first order state's missing, it seems to me that one reasonable expectation you would have is that the experience would be the same. In which case, if that is so, that seems to me to indicate that the state which there is something that it's like for you to be in is the higher order state. So therefore that's the way I put the theory That's the state which when you're in it, there's consciousness. Now, the problem is that when you're in that state, what it's like for you is like being in the first order state because what it's like is the way the state describes and it's like being in that first order state. But you could have that without the first order state at all according to theory and your behavior would be very different because this state down here, which is missing is pushing the buttons and saying there's red out there. This state up here is saying, I experience red. I'm, I'm having red experience. So you would get them saying experience, yes. Now you would say push the button, they couldn't do it. So that's in principle a prediction that this kind of theory makes, which is different than the relational versions of the theory. The relational versions of the theory say when the state is missing in this case, your experience has got to change because it's that state, that's the conscious state which is contributing to what it's like for you and it's gone. So there's no conscious state. And in fact, that's the way Rocco Gennaro has argued. I think you know, that's wrong, but that seems to me an empirical question. Uh, which now we, if we could figure out how we could find cases like this, that would be a good way to test it. 
Now, maybe there are no cases where there is no first order state at all. So we should look for a more mismatchy kind of cases. And this is traditionally an objection to the higher order theory. And what I've argued is that we should reinterpret it as a prediction of the theory and a way to distinguish the relational versus non-relational versions of the theory. And so now we can design some experiments. And if we're interested in these theories, we can falsify one or the other of them by looking at how they would differ in these kinds of cases. Because the relational version of the theory says what you should experience here is red, even though maybe you say green. Whereas the non-relational theory says you experience green, even though you press buttons saying there's red. So now how you test that is the tricky thing. But if we could find a way to test that, this is the way to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate these theories. And of course, the same is true here, even when the first order state is missing, you still should be saying that you see green, experiencing green, even though behaviorally, um, you know, nothing and that what's out there really is a red object, physically red. Okay. So that's the way I interpret the horror, the horror theory, the higher order representation of a representation. Having that representation is what consciousness is. Now, uh, the way I read the other version, the non-relational, but not my way of doing it version, um, the one I attribute to Rosenthal and Weisberg, is that what they want to do is talk like a relationalist, but not be one. So the way I read them is that what they say is like, this is the conscious state down here, the first order state. But this state being conscious just is having the higher order thought show up. So that when you say that this state is conscious, you're not really saying much about it. You're really saying there's a higher order thought around. But still, the state that there's something that it's like for you to be in on this reading is the first order state. Whereas according to me, the state which there's something that it's like for you to be in is the higher order state. Whereas it seems to me Rosenthal's view is that there's nothing that it's like to be in the higher order state, but having the higher order state generates there being something that it's like to be in this first order state which just encourages the relational reading of the theory. Now, the reason why Rosenthal can say this sort of stuff is because he has a background theory of intentionality on which it doesn't really matter. And he denies any sort of, I mean, it's technical philosophy stuff, but it's kind of inferential holism. He denies any sort of real reference relation that's beyond description, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. So you can have that sort of view, but, that, but that's a very controversial theory about what concepts are and what intentionality is, which I personally don't accept. And so I think that this way of doing things you have to accept that theory of intentionality or else you get yourself into very weird puzzles. Like for example, this puzzle, what do you say when the first order state's missing? Well, if you're a traditional higher thought theorist, you say the first order state is the conscious state, but there is no first order state. So what, I mean, the notional state is conscious, the non-existent state is conscious. Well, I heard Rosenthal say that once in a presentation and the general reaction amongst the crowd was, what? Now, that was my reaction. But if you press him, he just means, oh, you're just in the higher order state. That's all it means to be in a non-existent conscious state. But that to me is just a misleading way of putting things. It doesn't clarify the situation. It doesn't help you understand how you would test the theory, what you would look for if the theory were right. You can talk that way if you can accept that there are non-existent things that have properties. Personally, I don't, I can't, my theory of intentionality says there aren't those things. Anyway, so this is not a terminological dispute. Now it's a, could, empirically, could you differentiate this dispute? Yeah, but do we have the tools to do it? Uh, I'm not sure because you would have to really test what happens in cases like this. And that may be beyond our ken, but it definitely doesn't seem terminological to me. Now, suppose you say, well, and sometimes people have said, look, that kind of case where there's no first order state doesn't exist, never happens. So there's always some first order state that can be described as the conscious state. But I don't see how uh, a view like the Weisberg Rosenthal one can make sense of this. So in this case, when I'm misrepresenting the first order red state as green, is this a really bad description of the red state? Well, that seems like a really weird thing to say to me. I mean, you could say, yeah, the red state's the conscious state. It's just that you're describing it as green, so it's conscious as green. I, I, that's a way of talking to me. It's just very confusing. I'm sure you can make sense of it if you're very careful about the language, but people who test theories aren't often that careful with the language, so how you say things matters. So this way of putting the thing just confuses the issue from my point of view. And this kind of thing is ubiquitous from Rosenthal's theory. All the time, we have cases where 
there's a first order state, say representing red, but I'm aware of it in different ways. Like I may be aware of it myself as seeing strawberry red or cherry red and having those different contents changes the experience, even though the first order state stays the same. And on Rosenthal's way of doing things, this happens all the time, it's normal. So how do you make sense of the idea that this state is the conscious state in both of those cases, if you have this descriptivist view and you don't posit any kind of targeting relation that's real, that I, I can't make sense of it. I mean, I don't, well, the way you can make sense of it, I can't accept. This is just to kind of put the puzzle together again. Suppose you had these two states, this is an objection Ned kind of came up with block and I like it. Suppose you had these two first order states that are different re representations of red. You have this higher order state, you have a conscious experience. So which one is the target here? One of these seems like it should be the conscious state, but which one? Well, it doesn't seem like there's any good answer to that on Rosenthal's theory. All right, so summing up then, what do I think we can learn from all of this stuff? Um, I see, uh, I have a few minutes. I, I'm uh, trying to be done within the next five minutes or so. So summing up then, um, I think there are two lessons that we can kind of take from this really abstract conceptual journey about how to, th how to think about the higher to thought theory um, from the point of view of trying to falsify it, trying to test it, trying to build um, an experimental design that actually gets at what the theory is saying. So the one, the first lesson I think is we have a question about whether there's relational content in the content of the higher order state, which plays any role in the explanation of phenomenal consciousness. And there are different predictions made by the two camps. The relational theory say, yes, we should be able to find cases where there is a difference in the experience because there's a difference in which state you're related to, which state you're pointing at. Whereas the non-relational theory say, no, in those cases, experience will be invariant, even though your behavior will change. The experience will stay the same if you keep the same contents of the higher order state. So that seems to me to be an empirical question. And there are philosophical arguments for and against either side of answering that relational versus non-relational question. But I'm not interested in those as much as I am in the question of empirically, if it's wrong, show me that it's wrong, then I'll stop talking about it. Like all these philosophical objections are interesting, but show me the experiment that falsifies the theory or the, the suite of experiments or the, the swath of evidence, whatever it is, show me that. And then we can put these theories to rest. Because I don't think the philosophical objections carry that much weight from my point of view, which is why I've tried to turn them into empirical conjectures so we can say, look, you know, here's what the theory says. Let's go look for it and find out whether it's right or wrong. And I would be happy to find out it's wrong and move on with my life. Uh, so that's why I think this stuff is. So that's the first question. Can we, can we empirically differentiate between these versions of theories, which also would have some relation to the first order, higher order debate, generally speaking. So it'd be good to do this even if you didn't like higher order thought theories. So the second lesson I think is that, so there's another question, which is maybe you don't like the relational bit as an explanation for consciousness, but what about as an explanation for what state gets picked out by the higher order bit? There, I think you do need to postulate a kind of relational aspect to the content. So you get different predictions by what I call pure and mixed theories. Um, and the way I think of things, the horror theory is a mixed theory, whereas the Rosenthal Weisberg and the Hakuan Lao, those are pure theories on different ends of the spectrum. David is a Rosenthal Weisberg is a pure descriptivist content theory. Hakuan Lao is a pure pointer content theory. And the view I think that's in the middle, which is underexplored, is you need both of those kinds of content but they do different things, but they're both there. So you need the descriptive content to account for how you experience the state, but you need the pointer content to pick out what state you're aware of. And I've argued in my other work that this may play some kind of functional role. So maybe the pointer content keeps the first order representation online, enhances its profile. Maybe it routes it to the global workspace Maybe it routes it for further downstream processing. I've interpreted some empirical results as sort of suggesting things like this, like the unconscious change blindness stuff. But anyway, so that's a different whole different talk. But I think that the Rosenthal-Weisberg model, they don't think that there's any kind of 
pointer content that you'll find in the higher order state. They think it's all this kind of descriptive content and that's all that there is. Whereas I think you're gonna get that and also the pointer content. So now we can differentiate the three kinds of theories by how they respond to the variations amongst descriptive content and pointer content. If we were ever able to, like I've seen some recent papers that are very interesting by some people in this audience trying to differentiate different aspects of the signal from the higher order brain areas and the prefrontal cortex, for example. And if we could figure out like what part was the pointer content and what part was kind of the conceptual content and keep the pointer content the same and vary description content, one theory predicts experience changes, behavior stays the same. The other theory predicts the opposite and vice versa. So it seems to me that there are ways of differentiating these theories. Now, then the real question is, how do you take all of this abstract stuff and apply it to a concrete implementation in the brain and experiment? And there's a whole other talk which would have to be given. To, that's why there's really, as I say, a book that has to be written here to make sense of all this stuff. But that's a, that's a separate question. Um, so anyway, this is what I would predict uh, that you're gonna find these kinds of cases and that the, uh, the other theories are gonna say you, aren't, you don't find those kind of cases. Anyway, all right, so I think that's really all that I have to say, so I just explicitly say those things right here um, uh, that I already said, but you know, very descriptive content, keep pointer same. I say you're gonna get different experiences, but behavior's the same. Other way, your behavior change or experience same. Okay, so those seem to me like predictions, figuring out how to test them is really kind of what I'm imploring people to think about. And what I, you know, I think it's really interesting that people are starting to think about these questions. So I'm happy to put up with these kind of abstract talks from philosophers trying to clarify conceptual positions um, so that we can get to the next more interesting level of the nitty gritty of the empirical details and how they relate to these various conceptual structures and theories that we've been discussing. So I, I just also wanted to mention my discussion series at the end that Steve mentioned, my consciousness live. Uh, I'll be talking next week with Noam Chomsky. Um, I'm very excited about that. So unfortunately it's at the same day as the ASSC, so I'll have to miss that, but it's recorded online. If, I'm gonna try to figure out what he thinks about consciousness for once and for all. And uh, you see some other interesting persons that you may know up here, Claire Sargent, Lucia Maloney, Leah Murdoch. L lots of people uh, that are very interesting and serious thinkers about consciousness from all different perspectives. I'm interested in talking with them. So uh, I, I really appreciate these kind of opportunities to have these discussions and I look forward to our discussion now. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Richard. So first of all, we should unmute and give you a round of applause for the great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank you. We're going to the recording so people 